Welcome to the Evergreen Thumb, your go-to podcast for up-to-date research-based horticulture and environmental stewardship knowledge to help you grow and manage your garden. Produced by Washington State University Extension Master Gardener Volunteers and brought to you by the Master Gardener Foundation of Washington State. I'm your host, Aaron Hoover, a WSU Extension Master Gardener since 2015 and a certified permaculture designer and modern homesteader. WSU Master Gardener Volunteers are university-trained community educators who have been cultivating plants, people, and communities since 1973. Are you ready to grow? Let's dig into today's episode. Welcome to episode 21 of The Evergreen Thumb. My guest today is Keith Decker, and he's here to talk to us about plant amnesty and um, what they advocate for best pruning practices. Keith has worked in the horticultural industry for almost 50 years, including garden centers, greenhouses, nurseries, and landscape maintenance. For the last 27 years, he's had his own business focusing on the care of residential properties in the Pacific Northwest, mainly focusing on pruning. He's deeply involved with the Clallam County Master Gardener Program, dividing his time between the three-acre demonstration garden in Squim, teaching classes and workshops, and the many facets of an active group like Extension Master Gardeners. He is also a longtime member of Plant Amnesty, which is based in Seattle. Keith, thanks for joining me today. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Aaron. So let's start off by having you tell us a little bit about yourself and your experience as a gardener. Well. I grew up in Chicago, uh, moved to uh, Colorado when I was in my early 20s, um, and then eventually moved to Seattle uh, in 1990. I've been involved in uh, horticulture pretty much along the whole way. My first job in Chicago was in an inner city garden center and florist. That was very interesting. Um, And so over the Colorado and Washington state, I have been in greenhouses, nurseries, garden centers, um, landscape maintenance. Um, So I've kind of touched on a little bit of everything. And luckily, you pick up a few things along the way. You're not always paying attention, but uh, some things rub off. So I, once I was in uh, Seattle, I started my own business uh, working on landscapes at residential homes. And I did that for roughly 23 years on my own. Moved out to the Olympic Peninsula eight years ago. Continued to do it. I'm trying to retire. Um, That's not working so well. But I joined the local Master Gardeners, the Clallam County Master Gardeners in 2017. And it's a great group of folks. And so I'm very busy with them as well. So I, I'm getting to the point to where I don't have time to actually work for clients because I'm doing so much with the Master Gardeners. But that's, that's good. All right. So I'm assuming uh, while you were in Seattle is when you got involved with Plant Amnesty? Yes, I did. I was working for a nursery at the time. Uh, took a couple of years and, and worked at a retail nursery. I was in their little dingy lunchroom. And uh, bored, looking through the stack of magazines on the table for something to read. And there was the Plant Amnesty newsletter. So I was reading that, and it it was pretty hilarious. Um, (laughs) And there was another one, so I dug that one out. And uh, it was just really funny. And I thought, well, um, this sounds like a, a good group of people to meet. And they're local. And so I looked up one of their meetings and and went to one meeting, and I thought it was really fun great folks. And then it that's where it all started. It just kept going for years and years and years. Uh, it turns out that that sense of humor uh, was Cass Turnbull, the founder of Plant Amnesty. And um, she's the one that directed uh, uh, that, that group. She founded it back in 1987. So I was probably reading that newsletter about 1996. So that's about the time I joined. And um, she had me on the board in no time. She had me on committees. Uh, She had a real talent for talking people into things that they didn't think they were ready for. And so, uh, yeah, that's where it started. Let's talk about what uh, Plan Amnesty does and and what their mission is. Yeah. So um, originally, Cass Turnbull named it Plan Amnesty because the, the name made her laugh. 
And so it was kind of on a, a little whim that she came up with this. And it, uh, years later, here we are, and the numbers are about 1,200 members in 46 states and five countries. So it's, it really did take off. Um, its mission is to provide education, resources, and advocacy to prevent malpruning and preserve urban green spaces. Now, Cass's original um, mission was to end the senseless torture and mutilation of trees and shrubs, you know, which I also got a, a smile from folks, but it made a lot of sense because that's where, that's where it began. Uh, she worked for the Seattle Park System uh, f- Department for about uh, 11 years. And uh, she rode around with John Turnbull, who eventually became her husband. And he would point out malpruned trees all over the place and shrubs. And he'd go, oh, that, oh, that really hurts. And she got to uh, feel the same way about things. And finally, she was doing it more than he was. And he said, listen, you know, quit complaining. Do something about it. She said, okay, I'm going to start something here. So she did. And so this, this group continues to uh, move ahead. Uh, they use public media to uh, alert the public to what they call crimes against nature in their own backyards, specifically tree topping and the nuisance pruning of shrubs where you see everything sheared beyond recognition. Uh, once they get their attention, then they have um, solutions. And that's a referral service of skilled gardeners and arborists. They offer classes and workshops. They have instructional YouTube videos. You can still go see casts talking about things. And then they have a lot of how-to literature on selective pruning, both in English and Spanish. Nice. Well, we'll we'll definitely link to their YouTube channel so people can check out some of those videos. Uh, Plan Amnesty has a Facebook page, but you can go to planamnesty.org and um, access all of their information. Tell us a little bit more about Cass. So I was drawn to Plan Amnesty by uh, by Cass's sense of humor, um, and you know she had a lot of what we call Cassisms, um, things that that I still repeat to this day. Uh, one of them is wander, ponder, and prune. So don't just go in there without a clue. Just you know walk around that tree or that shrub, wander and ponder, and then go in there and do your work. She would also say, uh, well, she came up with the term malpruning, which is like malpractice. And um, every time I type that into a a message, uh, the computer says, this is an incorrect spelling. I don't know this word. Well, it's a word. We use it all the time. Uh, She would also say, if if plants died after we malpruned them or pruned them incorrectly, we would learn the correct way in a hurry. You know, they don't. They still leaf out. You, You butcher that tree. And you go, oh, oh, no, it, it's okay. It got leaves this year. I didn't kill it. I must have done it right. Well, no, you didn't. <laughs> so with a flower and garden show in Seattle, uh, we would always have a booth there. Uh, we would give lots of uh, helpful advice. We would have all of our literature there. But we'd also have all these photographs on the board there behind us of all these butchered plants. And it was the... Um, the pruning, the pruning whores hall of shame. And we also had the ugly yard contest where she would have people send in photos of just butchered plants and trees around their neighborhood. And then we would, we would make an award for the best, best or worst, I guess, um, situation. So she also authored, uh, her book, uh, Cass Turnbull's guide to pruning. It's in its third edition. It is still a real go-to book. I see that book recommended a lot of times when I go to different sites on pruning, and there it is. Uh, she did cover most of the shrubs that you're going to find in your yard and talks about them specifically. She also talks about why you should prune it a certain way, and if you don't, what you're going to end up with, and all the while using her, her sense of humor throughout yeah, I have a copy of that book and it is, I really learned a lot. Um, and I like the way she grouped like the different types of shrubs into categories that, so you could kind of have a general idea how to prune each type of shrub. Absolutely. Um, that was one of the big things I took away. But also the the big thing I took away from that book was that um, 
if you're pruning right, especially like on fruit trees, you don't get water spots. Right. So like in fruit trees, if you do a little summer pruning, uh, you will you will break that routine of the water sprouts. Because in the winter, if you just shave everything off, the plant has all this stored energy and now it's going to want to replace everything you took off. Boom. It's all this water sprout growth and it's all one year growth. It's not going to produce fruit unless you leave some of that, turns into two year wood, gets fruit spurs, bingo. But do a little summer pruning of some of those water sprouts that you've left and they're not going to shoot up in the fall because the plant is actually headed towards dormancy at that time. So you can, you work with the plants um, and you can actually figure it out. Those, uh, those groups of plants, the breaking plants into three groups, like the mounting habit shrubs, the cane growers, and then the tree-like shrubs really guides you towards how to prune them. So uh, the tree-likes, you treat them like trees, they get very little uh, pruning. Um, the cane growers, things like hydrangeas, red twig dogwood, um, forsythia, you can prune them quite hard. Uh, you want to time it for the right time of year, just after the coldest part of the winter, but you can take quite a bit out of those as opposed to, say, the tree likes. So you'll get to know what your plants are, and that kind of tells you how to prune them. Uh, I used to tell some customers, I say, well, I don't really know what this is, but I know how to prune it because of the structure of the plant. And then they kind of look at you and go, hmm, did I hire the, the right guy? So, yeah. Okay. So what are some of the key principles that Plant MC advocates for maintaining healthy landscapes and well-pruned uh, plants? Well, you know, it, a lot of it goes back to basics. And the first thing is right plant, right place. If you plant a plant in the correct spot, it's not going to require a lot of pruning. So you put it in its area. You don't put the tree next to the house. You don't put um, 12 foot growing shrubs in front of your windows that you're going to want to see out of. So uh, the reason a lot of folks prune is because they planted things in the wrong place or they had no idea this was going to get as big as it was or they overplanted. There's a lot of overplanting because we want to see things looking good by lunchtime. We look out the window, go, that's beautiful. And then in two or three years, we're going, it's a mess. I've got to prune all those things away from each other and so on. I remember going to a customer's house and they proudly showed me a, a little planting bed next to their front door. And he said, what do you think? And I said, oh, nice uh, little four by four bed right by the door. And they had planted seven Leyland cypress trees. Well, those get to be pretty big, maybe 100 feet tall and almost as wide. And I said, those are beautiful, but you need to pull all those out and put them somewhere else. But they were cute at the nursery. And, uh, you know, that's why we call it a nursery because they're all little babies out there. And they either didn't have a tag on them or they believed the tag because a lot of tags don't tell the complete truth. So that was another thing I learned from Cass. Don't believe the tag. Yeah, I learned a lot. Along similar lines, it's the mature size is not, doesn't mean it stops growing. No. And and when folks plant, they, they want a fast growing plant, evergreen, because they want to screen out their neighbor's garage. So they want something that grows in a hurry. So you say, well, there's a Leyland Cypress that grows three to four feet a year. Oh, perfect. But it's not going to grow up to the roof line of that garage and stop. It's going to continue three to four feet a year until it gets to be a monster. So if you're not paying attention and pruning it uh, right away when it gets to where you want it, you'll have to come back later and hire those guys with the lift truck and they're going to come in there. It's going to be a much more expensive job than it was uh, when they were younger. Uh, so so right plant, right place. Um, that's, that's kind of the basis. But then you get into um, understanding a plant's response to the cuts you're going to make. So we pretty much deal in two basic cuts. You've got the heading cut, which is where you just basically cut the head off of a branch, um, removing that apical bud. And what happens when you do that? You stimulate the buds underneath your cut. So now you're going to get about yeah, three to four shoots coming out right below your cut. 
if that's what you're after, great. Uh, if you're trying to generate more branches on that side of the plant, or if it's a fruit tree and you're trying to get more growth out of it, there you go. But if that's not what you want to do, and you're just trying to shorten your plant, then you don't want to use a head and cut. You want to use what we call a branch removal cut or what uh, has been known as thinning cuts. And you cut to another branch. You cut to something. You leave something, not just dormant buds. And then the energy can then go into that branch and the growth uh, will be much more contained and you won't have to deal with a lot of excess growth or water sprouts or that type of thing. If you end up using the branch removal cut more often, you'll find that you're doing less pruning every year. I mean, there are uh, fruit trees that I go back to or Japanese maples and you look at them and you go, I can walk right past that tree now. It's good. It's good this year. I don't have to do anything. So that's, that's kind of nice. And that is just using the correct cuts. So th that's really what they promote. One subject that Cass started with was uh, tree topping. There was a lot of tree topping and she had quite the campaign. We ended up with billboards. We went on TV. Um, she went and spoke all over the state and other states. And it really did make a difference. There were a lot of arborists that uh, started to join Plant Amnesty, started to uh, become uh, certified arborists and learning why you should do some types of pruning and not on others. And um, we started to really gain on that. Unfortunately, it seems like things have changed a bit. Um, I still see tree topping uh, quite a bit. Uh, we also see a lot of shearing, all this excess shearing of everything. And um, Plant Amnesty would always teach how to prune without having to shear. Uh, use the grab and snip method, selective pruning. Uh, if you selectively prune a flowering shrub, it doesn't matter what time of year you prune it because you're selectively pruning it. You're leaving flower buds. If you're shearing it, well, yes, it does matter. You better sh uh, shear right after bloom. Otherwise, you're not going to get bloom next year. I think the shearing epidemic has increased with the increase of power tools and now battery po uh, operated power tools where all these crews can just go out there and you don't have to know what a plant is uh, to work on a landscape crew, but you do ne need to know your shapes, circles and squares. And they obviously know those, those shapes. So that's what they do. They just make circles and squares out of everything. And it's sometimes it's comical if you're, if you're not going to cry. <laughs> you come up to something and go, oh, my God, that's a Japanese maple. That ball on the stick is a Japanese maple. I have pictures of all of this stuff. <laughs> the other day I was at a, a store and they had planted salal on the shady side of the, the building. Well, salal works in the shade. It's considered ground cover, although it's kind of a big ground cover, grows in the forest here. And the crew must have come up against that and gone, those are kind of unruly. And they turned them into round balls and a hedge. And it's like, you're kidding. <laughs> so it's I, a native plant. Yeah. So it's completely wrong for the plant. And the plant will sit there for a while and put up with it until it rolls over and dies. And then they'll put something else in there. But um, yeah, we call that parking lot pruning. Unfortunately, a lot of folks see that and they bring that home. And, um, you know, dad just got that uh, power tool for Christmas and he's eager to try it out. So, um, yeah, unfortunately, there's a lot of that still going on. Is there a way to correct or um, revitalize a plant that's been shorn? Uh, depends on the plant. So, yeah, the answer is yes. Uh, there are quite a few plants that you can uh, repair uh, or renovate. It depends on what type of plant they are. So you go back to the types, and if it's a cane grower, say you have a uh, hydrangea that's been uh, a ball for years, and, and you just moved there and you inherited this, this poor shrub, you can take that down uh, radically in the early spring, late, late winter, early spring, cut it pretty much to the ground and start over. You won't have any blooms for a season and maybe two, but if you don't 
continue shearing it, it'll turn back into its uh, more natural state. So there are plants you can deal with that way. Um, some plants, if they butchered a tree so heavily, um, you may want to just remove it. And, uh, you know, that'd be a harder thing to do. But with top trees, you know, they will produce the water sprouts because they're trying to replace what you took off. If you left those water sprouts on for some years, they will actually continue to branch. The weight will make them curve a little bit. They'll turn into more natural branches. So the tree could recover its, we'll say, its original look. Unfortunately, when branches are stimulated uh, via water sprouts, they are poorly connected to the tree. Um, and so they are more likely to break off with snow load or winds or something like that. So it's not the best thing, but you can, uh, if you leave a tree alone and let those water sprouts develop, it can uh, develop into branches again. One thing I just thought of, because we've been talking about water sprouts, but a lot of people tend to refer to them as suckers. Yes. Or so I thought we might mention that there is a difference. Um, water sprouts are come off of a branch, whereas the suckers come from the ground level. Right. So the suckers will come up from the ground. And especially if you have a, uh, a grafted plant like roses or there are some trees that are grafted. And if those suckers are coming up from uh, the ground around your tree, they're not coming out of the trunk, but they're coming out next to it. It's probably the rootstock. And it won't be the same plant as what you purchased and planted. So uh, in the spring, you'll see some flowering plums that will be pink and white. And you go, oh, that's interesting. Uh, they don't sell them that way. What happened is some suckers came up and intermingled in there. You didn't really notice it. And when it blooms, you go, oh, it's got different colored flowers, uh, which is okay, except that suckers do eventually take over. Um, the rootstock is quite strong, and so they will take over the rest of that tree or rows. A lot of times, the roses will uh, revert to rootstock, and that top, that rose that you purchase for its fragrance and its color will slowly decline while the suckers really take off. So it's good to pay attention to where they're coming from. Water sprouts are up there on the on the branches. They're a response to your pruning. So aside from shearing, what others are some other common pruning mistakes? Well, a mistake that a lot of folks make when they're uh, removing a branch from, say, a tree uh, or a large shrub is they know what they want to do. They've got the tool and they just make it in one cut. The problem with that is most times there's too much weight on that branch. So when you make that final cut close to the trunk, it strips down the bark as it falls. Uh, so what you do is you take the weight of that branch off first. So you make a three-step cut. You make a little notch about a foot away from the trunk on the branch, on the underside of the branch. Then your second cut is on top of that. Boom, the branch snaps off and it's out of the way. It falls on the ground. You've got a one-foot piece of branch left on the tree. Now you can make a nice, concise cut and not have it strip down the tree. So that, that's something I see a lot of. Um, they just either don't know that or they're just figuring, well, this time it's not going to happen. Well, I've tried that in the past and <laughs> you regret that you didn't uh, take the time to do it. Uh, the other thing is you need to pay attention to where the branch collar is on your tree. Uh, don't make a flush cut on the tree or you're going to open that tree to rot. Uh, you're actually wounding the tree itself. Uh, the trunk. Whereas if you come out a little ways and leave that little bump that sticks out from the trunk, uh, the tree can deal with that wound uh, much, much better. And, you know, pruning is wounding a plant. Uh, all those cuts that we make um, does wound the plant. And, you know, a lot of folks say, oh, the, the plant feels so much better now that you're finished. And I'm like, no, it doesn't. <laughs> if you could hear it scream, <laughs> But, uh, you know, we're, we're wounding the tree. The other, the other thing people like to say is, oh, the, look, thank you for giving my plants a haircut. And, uh, you know, Cass used to say, well, you know, if our hair grew like, uh, like the plants, um, it, it would grow much faster and all the ends would be um, split out, you know, all of the, the branches because they'd be splitting out all those, those buds would be stimulated. So 
cut outside of the branch collar, leave a small bump, don't make a flush cut. Uh, if you leave a little stub, it's not the worst thing in the world. It's actually better than if you made a flush cut and cut into the trunk. Uh, later, you'll see that stub starting to die off, and you'll usually see where it's going to die off too. Uh, it'll die off just outside of that branch collar, and then you can finish your cut, you know, next year or whatever. You always want to use really good quality tools. Uh, it is surprising how many people try to uh, prune with really poor tools. They don't pick them up very often, so they don't think about it that often. Uh, some of them have been sitting outside uh, rusting. Even master gardeners come in and they'll say, hey, could you teach me how to do this? And they bring out their loppers and I'll go, oh my gosh. <laughs> you know, buy yourself a good tool. Uh, so I always tell people when you go to a shop for tools, it should hurt a little bit. It should hurt you at the pocketbook. That means you're buying something that probably is made of good materials. It'll hold an edge better. It'll be easier on your body because um, a dull tool is just a lot more work and you're going to have tired muscles from trying to make that work. And you're also not going to have any fun. Uh, you're just going to go, yeah, this thing, I don't like this tool and go do something else. So buy good tools and, um, you know, those, those hand pruners are, they they're made with really bright red handles so that you don't lose them. Well, you, people still lose them or they set them on the fence post or they put them on the yard waste bin and they fall in and then they go off, you know, when the guy picks up the yard waste. If you buy yourself a scabbard or a pouch that fits on your belt or clips on your, on the waist of your pants you will save a lot of money by not losing all those good pruners. And uh, that's, what, that's what I've done. I've got one that looks really, really old because it's been with me for many, many years, but I don't lose my hand pruners that way. So one thing I've heard, and you can tell me if this is correct or not, is for, for loppers or pruners, having a bypass blade is better Absolutely. Um, because it makes cleaner cuts. Yes, yes. So it needs to be a bypass uh, pruner. Both your loppers and your hand pruners should be bypass. And what that means is the blades go past each other like a scissors. And that makes a really good cut. There's another type of uh, pruner called an anvil pruner. And it has a blade that goes down on a flat bed. And many times the bark of the plant does not cut completely and it tears. And um, if you leave a ragged cut on your plants, um, it can lead to more disease and pr other problems. So good clean cuts uh, help the plant deal with those wounds that you're doing. Yeah, I think I heard one time that the with those anvil styles that if they're also if they're not sharp, they'll just crush the plant material, yes. which then again is not a, like you said, it's not a clean cut. Nope, nope. So if you're some folks will use those for cut flowers and so on. I just I just never liked them. Uh, you know, everybody's got their favorites, but if you have a good sharp bypass pruner. Um, you'll see the difference. The other thing is to occasionally sharpen it. Um, uh, clean it off a little bit. Um, you can use something like Lysol or, or just uh, isopropyl alcohol to soak it a little bit. You know, I just spray it on. Then I'll use a little uh, scrubby, like they have those kitchen scrubbies, to take off the gunk. Once that's off, I'll maybe sharpen it a little bit. I'll use a very fine file to put an edge on that blade and you only sharpen the one blade and you sharpen it on one side. Um, then you put a little bit of lubricant on it and it's like a new, new pruner. It's amazing. You say, why didn't I do this before? Uh, and some of the lubricants that um, they now have, I, I buy one that's a plant-based lubricant. It lasts so much longer than those petroleum based ones do. And then you don't have the mess as well. Uh, so I do that occasionally. Sometimes if I'm with a customer or a master gardener, they'll have their tool and I'll, I've got my truck with my stuff in it and I'll go here just a minute and I'll run through it real quick and tell them what I'm doing and hand it back to them. And they're just amazed at how much better that tool is. So uh, buy good tools and take care of them. So how does limbing up a tree affect the health of the tree or its overall function? Well. The reason for limbing up a tree uh, can be a couple things. One is access. You don't, you're don't. you tired of hitting your head when you're mowing around that tree. Um, you've got people, 
there's a sidewalk, there's children playing, you want to get those branches out of the way. It also can be for the looks of the garden. Uh, it's really nice to see past a tree. So instead of topping the tree and making it smaller because this thing seems so big, limit up a little bit. You don't have to deal with those higher branches and you can see past it. So a lot of folks with view, they say, oh, that tree's in the way. Well, the tree is part of the view. So uh, maybe limit up a little bit, maybe take off a few uh, crossing branches and lighten it up a little bit and you can still have your view and then you still have a tree. Uh, when a tree is very young and you just planted it, um, you don't want to take all those lower branches off right away, even though you will eventually, because those tr branches are feeding the trunk of that tree. So it can actually adversely affect uh, the growth of that tree if you take and strip everything off except for those high branches, because that's what you're, you're going to keep down the road. So you can slowly limb those trees up as need be. So one thing that I heard, and maybe you can tell me if this has been your experience, is particularly with evergreens, um, if you're if you're limbing them up, it can affect their the ability of those lower branches to handle a snow load. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, evergreens, and of course, it depends on the evergreen and how their what their growth habit is. Evergreens are more susceptible to snow load because they're evergreen; they are going to catch more snow. Uh, some evergreens are more brittle than others. Um, you can have pines breaking uh, with a snow load where some other uh, conifers will not have that same effect. Douglas firs can snap uh, with snow load and it'll just take the, all the branches will go bang, 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 bang all the way down just because they're a little bit more brittle as opposed to something like a, a grand fir or a hemlock or something like that. So you want to always pay attention with your limbing up of what you're leaving. Um, maybe you have to shorten some of those branches on the tree to compensate for what you're doing, to kind of balance it out and, and think about what the snow load's going to be, or are you going to give it space for the snow to go through it? Um, on conifers, if you are pruning in the green zone where there's active growth, it'll usually be fine. But if you're going back to what we call the dead zone or um, areas that are have no green on them whatsoever and you prune it back to there, it's pretty much going to just die back to the tree. Uh, conifers do not break bud like uh, deciduous trees do. Deciduous trees, you can cut a tree down and it'll send up uh, sprouts for years and years and years until that roots, uh, those roots die. A conifer, you cut it off, it's dead. It's not going to break bud like that. So you think about that when you prune uh, the branches of a conifer, if you're going to shorten them, uh, you want to cut back to the green area and try not to cut back further. Otherwise, you're going to have, uh, you're going to show some dead branches. Folks make that mistake with junipers, you know, when they're uh, junipers or small pines next to a walkway. And it's been e eating the sidewalk for some years and they go, well, you know, we got to get our sidewalk back. Or there's a new owner that shows up and they say, we, where's the sidewalk? So now they cut that juniper back about four feet into it, and it's a dead zone. And they usually, when they do that, they just buzz it straight, you know, right with the edge of the sidewalk. And you'll see about a three-foot dead section, and then with a little uh, green top. And that dead section's not going to re-sprout. You're going to be looking at that for, well, as long as uh, you live there. So try to prune those plants away from your uh, sidewalks much earlier, when they're much younger. And one of the tricks to doing that is to lift the branches off the walk, reach underneath and cut those that are down below. And some of those branches are going to be the ones that go furthest out to your sidewalk. Remove those. And then when you let the branches down, you'll see, oh, it still looks natural. All my cuts are hidden. I can go ahead and finesse that edge now without um, making it look really bad. So the trick is to cut, uh, if you're going to be making pruning cuts, make them earlier uh, than later. Same goes with trees and shrubs. If you're going to reduce the size of something, do it now while the cuts are small. Don't wait till you're making really large cuts, three or four inches across, because then the tree or shrub is going to have a real hard time dealing with those big cuts. 
So we talked a little bit with uh, fruit trees and, and doing some summer cuts to help prevent water spouts. Are there other timing specific for certain types of plants to make cuts? Yeah. Um, most of your pruning is done, well, on deciduous plants. Most most times you're going to be pruning during the dormant season. Uh, the leaves are off. You can see the structure of the plant. It's easier to figure it out at that time. Um, or the spring when, when plants are starting in their active growth and you want things to branch out or um, get it off your driveway, that type of thing. Spring is usually the time to do that. If you're doing summer pruning, um, and you're pruning after the longest day. So say you're pruning after July 4th, you'll have very little growth happening after that. So with a hedge that is very vigorous, you pretty much only want to prune it once a year. You'd rather not be out there several times. So if you wait until after the longest day and then prune it, it's pretty much going to stay there until next year. If you prune it in April, it's going to bust bud and take off. And by the end of, of the summer, it's going to be unruly again. And you're going to go, I'm going to have to go back out there and do it again. So if you can be patient, let it have its flush of growth and then go out and, pr and prune it, it'll stay much longer. Um, you can also use uh, that technique with other shrubs and so on. When uh, With the longer days, you'll get a lot less growth after that. So fruit trees we do summer pruning, and we do summer pruning in late July and in early August. And what we're doing is we're reducing some of the water sprout growth that, there, that is in there. We're also pruning some of the excess foliage away so that the fruit can ripen. It'll get more sunlight, uh, more airflow, less issues with insects and disease. And then if you look at that tree in the winter, you'll go, oh, there's not near as much to do. And if you do those two prunings with the fruit trees, you'll find that you're doing a lot less uh, than you used to. Yeah, I find summer pruning, too, is a good time to um, cut out deadwood at the same time because you can actually see. Yes. So if you do this all the time, you get to uh, recognize deadwood real easily. But if you don't, it's real hard to tell what's dead and what's not. So uh, in the summer after things leaf out or in the spring after things leaf out, you'll be able to see what's dead and what's not. And also, if you don't know, you scratch the a little bit of bark away with your hand pruner. And if it's green, uh, just wait. You know, we had some severe cold weather this last winter here in western Washington. A lot of plants uh, got hit very hard. And so it's a common topic of conversation with uh, homeowners about what they lost. And some of those plants will come back and some of them won't. But the, the big message is to be patient. Because in the next few weeks, with the gradual warming of the temperatures, we'll know what's live and what isn't. And the plant will show it to you, and then you can say, all right, yeah, that's worth keeping. I'll prune it to the live and let it continue. Or it's starting to sprout at the very ground level, and you say, well, no, that's, I'm not going to wait for, for that to get big again. We lost like well, we think we lost three Escalonia with that deep freeze. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm gonna. I'm waiting to mount until I'm sure they're not gonna leaf out. So yeah. So uh, top of the list is Escalonia. Everybody's Escalonia froze down, and it's going to depend on how uh, established your roots are as to whether that's going to come back. So if they weren't very established, it could have killed it all the way. Uh, if they are established. Cut all the dead, which is probably going to go to ground level. And if it starts to sprout from the base, it could come back fairly strong with a good size root mass. Uh, Ceanothus, um, all over town, uh, dead to the ground. And the jury's still out on whether any of that's going to come back. I'm going to take a look at some tomorrow, as somebody described, and, and see what they look like. But you can imagine uh, homeowners that had an entire a uh, huge screen of, of Ceanothus or Escalonia dividing them from their neighbors or whatever. And it's all brown now, just, just shot. And so, you know, a lot of these plants are on their northern edge of their range. And we're kind of lucky that we've been able to grow them this long. <laughs> but it, it kind of wakes us up and says, well, you know, maybe that's not the best choice. It may not happen for another 33 years. 
Um, but maybe it's going to happen next year again. So it's up to you whether you want to uh, continue to use those plants. Fortunately, all of our Cianothus seem to have made it. Really? The Escalonia. Yeah. And they were pretty young. So. Wow. So where, where do you live? I am in the Southwest Washington in the Chehalis River Valley. Okay. So, um, I'm South of you by about two or three hours. So how cold did you get? Um, upper teens. Okay. We had a lot of single digits here and, um, that's really rare. Uh, I just, I don't think I've ever seen single digits like that. And what happened was it sat on us for two days at their lowest point. And that was enough to really do in a lot of these plants. So, um, it'll be interesting to see what comes out of it. I've, I continue to look at some plants and they are slowly looking a little worse every time I see them. So I don't know where this dead zone is going to stop if some of these are going to come back or not. So yeah, we just have to wait and see. So what are some techniques we can use to rejuvenate um, overgrown or neglected plants? Well, sometimes uh, when when somebody says, you know, I've got um, I got a bunch of old Japanese maples and I've never pruned them. I start to salivate because I'd rather hear that than, oh, I've been, I've been keeping those short for years, you know, because then they're just going to be a mess. If they haven't done anything and they've just been neglected, then it's just a matter of deadwood, uh, which is a really therapeutic thing to do is just to go out and do deadwood. Or you've got some crossing branches, uh, maybe you're limbing things up, but you can work with it. You have something to work with. Uh, maybe you go in there and pull out all of the surrounding plants because they don't need to be there anymore. And you're trying to show this beautiful tree that's that's hidden in there. Um, that's kind of a nice thing. If if the plants are uh, really malpruned, it really comes down to what kind of plant they are. So you can renovate those cane growers. Uh, if they are mounding shrubs, you have to make a determination, is it worth it or not? Some of them, you can just leave them grow out of that shearing and they'll start to form branches again. Unfortunately, when you shear a plant, the inside is dead. If you spread it open, you'll look inside, it's all dead. And the reason is it doesn't get any more sunlight because of all those little heading cuts that you've been using with the shears. So um, if you ignore that and let that plant grow out, it can actually look a little bit natural down the road, but it may take a while. Um, others are just, you just say, I'm sorry, but that's, that's too ugly. Uh, life is short. I'm going to plant something that I really like and, and pull them out. Um, so it could be a mixed bag. It can be a real mixed bag. I had someone send me a picture of a sheared tree and ask me what it was. <laughs> and I'm looking at it. I'm like, I am really not sure because it was all sticks. And I think it was like a dogwood of some kind or something. And I'm like, just replace it because yeah. he just moved into this property. So I'm like, you might as well just put in something you really want. Exactly. Exactly. It would take years for that tree to come out of it. And maybe it will, never would. Um, maybe it's, they really impacted the health of that tree and it's a slow, slow, slow decline. And you know, why watch that out your window? Um, it becomes very hard to identify a lot of plants that are sheared. Um, I'll look at plants outside somebody's house and go, well, I know that's a holly. I know that's an escalone. I don't know what that is. I don't know what that is because all of the character has been taken off. So that, that really nice uh, leaf texture that you, you saw at the nursery uh, no longer does that because you're, you're shearing it heavily. It doesn't really bloom anymore. So you can't use that as an ID. So it, it becomes difficult. They're just little green blobs. And um, that really wasn't the intent. You know, there's a real disconnect between either what the homeowner had intended and now they shear because maybe the tools got to be more fun. I don't know. Um, or the in landscape, say it's a commercial landscape. There was a landscaper that designed that with uh, texture, color, um, evergreen, deciduous. They had reasons for it. Uh, this is going to grow tall. This is going to cover the ground and so on. And then years later, a different manager is caring for it or not caring for it and has a crew out there with their machines. And 
there is no longer any resemblance from that original plan. It's really a shame. I hope that landscaper doesn't live there anymore and doesn't go by there every day on his way to work. So one of my bigger pet peeves is um, when this a lot of the smaller cities that don't have actual landscaping crews. Mm -hmm. And it's just, you know, like our city has, uh, it's two people. We're a really tiny town. Mm. Um, and none of them have any um, landscape experience, really. And we have these beautiful flowering cherry trees in town, and they just butcher them like every two or three years. You should go talk to them. Just say, you know, um, <laughs> and what I see also is flowering, spring flowering trees like uh, flowering cherries or flowering plums. They come out early. They're really the only reason to have those trees out there because you're not producing fruit in a flowering cherry. The flowering plum, plums don't produce fruit. So it's the flowers. And a lot of times the crews are pruning them before they flower or while they're in flower. They're driving down the road to dump off the branches and all the flowers are flying out the back of their pickup truck. And you go, come on, give it three or four weeks before you go in there. Let them bloom and then do some of your pruning. But um, they really don't know it's on their schedule. And those trees look kind of wild. So they... They are out there to contain them. I think it's worth talking to some people. It's it's hard not to sometimes. Um, I, I keep myself from walking into buildings and going, did you pay somebody to do that? <laughs> but um, I think with, a, with a, a city caretakers, they would probably appreciate a little bit of education uh, and just say, you know what? You actually can do less work by doing it this way than the way you're doing it. So does Plant Amnesty have any resources for like how to approach cities or city governments or uh, crews? Well, they've worked with the uh, city of Seattle for quite a while in their tree ordinance. Um, but they do have uh, a referral service with uh, licensed arborists, uh, which is a good resource. If you um, had a, a arborist that came out just to talk to you about um, pruning practices, and paid them for their time, you'd learn a lot. Um, you could also have some of them do the work, but that's a great resource. You also have uh, licensed gardeners that are out there with a lot of knowledge, and they could help guide people. They not only do the physical work, but sometimes they do what's called garden coaching. Uh, the homeowner really would like to do some of the work, but they're kind of clueless as to how to approach it. So you really want to use these folks as a resource because they have a lot of knowledge and those uh, ISA certified arborists, um, they're very much up on their on the current uh, practices. Is there anything else that you would like to add about pruning or plant amnesty? We talked earlier about um, time of year on pruning. I just wanted to mention that uh, there's winter pruning, spring pruning, summer pruning. Don't prune in the fall. You really shouldn't be pruning anything in the fall. A lot of folks will try to tidy things up uh, at the end there before they're going to hibernate in the house and watch football all, we all winter. But don't go out there and prune things hard in the fall because it's going to generate young growth going into the coldest part of the year. And you'll lose more plant material that way than if you just wait until after the winter. So try to get all your pruning finished by August. Uh, and then also uh, in the fall, a lot of plants are stressed. They're drought stressed and you really shouldn't be pruning hard on plants that are stressed. Uh, a lot of folks forget to water their plants. And when we get uh, droughty periods, which we're getting more and more of, by the time uh, fall rolls around, a lot of your plants are very stressed. And the best thing you could do for them is give them a good drink of water. Well, thank you so much for joining me. This is great pruning information, and I'm glad to share um, plant amnesty with um, gardeners in the area as well. Yeah, have them look up the their website. Um, they're they're a lot of fun. You know, uh, I looked up their website, and it said um, it starts out with "We have a sense of humor, and we have a mission." <laughs> so they are they are continuing the uh, cast Turnbull. Uh, theme there, which is great. Yeah, and we will link to their website and their YouTube channel and things like that too. They have a lot of YouTube videos; they're great they do. resources. Yep, so. it's a lot of fun. All right, and we'll probably have some other um, WSU publications on pruning as well. Good. 
Well, I expect you to go after those uh, two people that are burning in your uh, city and uh, uh, and get them on the right track. Thank you for joining us on this episode of The Evergreen Thumb, brought to you by the WSU Extension Master Gardener Program volunteers and sponsored by the Master Gardener Foundation of Washington State. We hope that today's discussion has inspired and equipped you with valuable insights to nurture your garden. The Master Gardener Foundation of Washington State is a nonprofit organization whose primary purpose is to provide unifying support and advocacy for WSU Extension Master Gardener programs throughout Washington State. To support the Master Gardener Foundation of Washington State, visit www.mastergardenerfoundation.org forward slash donate. Whether you're an experienced Master Gardener or just starting out, the WSU Extension Master Gardener program is here to support you every step of the way. WSU Extension Master Gardeners empower and sustain diverse communities with relevant, unbiased, research-based horticulture education. Reach out to your local WSU Extension office to connect with Master Gardeners and tap into a wealth of resources that can help you achieve gardening success. To learn more about the program or how to become a Master Gardener, visit mastergardener.wsu.edu forward slash get hyphen involved. If you enjoyed today's episode and want to stay connected with us, be sure to subscribe to future episodes filled with expert tips, fascinating stories, and practical advice. Don't forget to leave a review and share it with fellow gardeners to spread the joy of gardening. Questions or comments to be addressed in future episodes can be sent to hello at theevergreenthumb.org. The views, thoughts, and opinions expressed by guests of this podcast are their own and do not imply endorsement by Washington State University or the Master Gardener Foundation of Washington State. Mm-hmm.